Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Yes? Wonderful. So good evening again and, and welcome to our Reconnections event. My name is Gerhard Affenpower. I am the Dean of the School of Management. I have the great pleasure of, invite, of uh, welcoming you to uh, our event uh, on new directions in leadership. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, Brent told me I could take half an hour for my lecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. <laughs> Two. Two? Thank you. Um, I'm still going to lecture to you and let me tell you a little bit about our strategic environmental analysis that we recently did for the School of Management. A few things came out of that. Uh, we have an external environment um, that is determined by a lot of different things. And one is um, what do employers want from graduates of a business school? Um, and there are things such as decision making, conflict resolution, cross cultural competence, mentoring, coaching. The word leadership isn't mentioned in that list, uh, which is coming out of a survey done by the Brand Management Initiative Council, but pretty much these are all leadership skills. And we also have a, an internal environment, which is determined, among other things, by our mission statement of the university. And uh, one of the things that our mission statement includes is that we want to educate leaders for a global society. Uh, we also want to help our students to find their purpose and find ways of living their purpose in, in their lives. So a lot of what we do is determined by leadership. And what does that mean for us? Well, I don't know. That's why we have a panel. Um, we have a panel of uh, experts on, on leadership for you tonight that are going to talk about what has changed in leadership, what will be changing in leadership, uh, and what that means for uh, people who are in, active in the workplace, but also for, for students. Um, let me introduce our panel to you. Uh, first, we have uh, Philippa Vesic. Uh, in November 2011, Philippa was elected to her third four-year term and selected as the 2011 Mayor Pro Tem of Westlake Village. In November 2012, Philippa was selected as the 2012 Mayor. Philippa has a strong business background in starting new businesses and helping run existing operations. She has worked in management as an owner, founder, and partner, as well as in operations, human resources, and in training production. Looking for a new and less hectic career, she recently went back to school and completed studies as a landscape designer. While being active in the business world, Philippa has also donated countless hours to her community, Los Virginia schools, and to the city of West Lake Village. Philippa holds a BA in psychology, graduating from the University of California at Santa Barbara in 1972, magna cum laude, and credentials as a landscape designer from Pierce Community College in 2003. Thank you, Philippa, for being here and uh, serving on our panel. Um, next, we have Mark Lefko to your very, to your very right. Uh, during 35 years as a corporate executive and investment banker, Mark Lefko also founded the Lefko Group, now one of the nation's leading facilitators for corporate retreats and CEO peer groups. He has coached and mentored 100 plus CEOs and led countless strategic planning retreats, corporate think tanks, and industry roundtables. In 2012, he founded the Conscious Leadership Connection, a network, forum, and resources for like minded leaders in business, government, and Mark is the author of Wake Up and Me, as well as Unlock the Power of the Team, How to Build a Powerful Organization Using Principles and Values. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for being here. And last but not least, to your left, we have Rich Ike. Uh, Dr. Ike has spent the last four decades studying the philosophies and fundamentals of true leaders. He's been a top executive, a military communications specialist, a U.S. Joint Chief, Chiefs of Staff Officer, college teacher, an administrator, a consultant, driver, and an entrepreneur. Along the way, he's worked with or for world leaders from Howard Holmes, Chief Nix, to Paul Monahan, Domino's Pizza founder, to Admiral Brennan Thompson. He's founder and president of Ike Associated, a strategic branding, marketing, communication, management, coaching firm. An adjunct professor, a frequent speaker, and a blogger for leadership and marketing, and a columnist for various publications. Rich? Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause. The way we are going to approach uh, this evening is that we are going to have a number of questions.
questions for all panelists on issues of leadership, and then towards the end we're going to open up uh, uh, for questions from, from the auditorium. So let me start off with a very general question, and maybe I can start with, uh, with Mark uh, to the right, and then pass the question off to the speakers. <laughs> What's new in leadership? Say the question. What is new in leadership? I think leadership, is everyone able to hear me without the microphone? Or better with the microphone? Better with the microphone. Right. I think leadership is is changing as you know as as we speak. The you know, there's so many challenges in the world, and the past has really revolved around command and control. And I and I really am seeing many shifts toward conscious leadership, which hopefully we'll have an opportunity to talk about. But it really is more about being in a collaborative environment and really being concerned and focused on doing doing um, making decisions for the greater good and collaborating with teammates and partners. Thank you, Mark. Well, Philippe, would you like to add to that? Well, I agree with Mark 100%, and that collaboration is really going far today. Though sometimes, you know, when you're trying to work with all these people together, um, an Argentine taxi driver said the best thing. He said sometimes he wished for a benevolent dictator just to get things done. But that's not the wave of the future. And as we learn how to work with each other better, things are moving along nicely. Thank you. Uh, Rich? I think all one has to do is look east to Washington, D.C. And unfortunately, we see daily more and more paralysis, it seems. Take it out. Okay, cool. So, uh, can you hear me? Better. Yeah. And I think it was Lee Hamilton, former congressman from the state of Indiana, who now directs the center at Indiana University in Bloomington, who maybe said it best, and that is we need leaders, and I think my two colleagues on my left have said this as well, we need leaders who can figure out ways to forge compromise among radically differing points of view. Because if we can't do that, we're not going to make the kind of progress, whether it's in business, whether it's in sports, whether it's in the military, whether it's in politics at every possible level. Mark, you've already given me the, uh, the clue, uh, the conscious leadership. Uh, what is that? How is it different from leadership as we knew it? I think conscious leadership is in business is understanding exactly, and understanding that, that making a profit, hitting your financial targets and objectives are very important. But it's equally, or if not more important, to be focused on uh, the greater good, and focusing on the greater good of all of the stakeholders that are involved in whatever decision it is that you're, that you're involved in making. Those stakeholders can be employees and customers and vendors and suppliers or bankers, even your communities and society. So it's having that broader perspective when you're making decisions. And I'll, I'll kind of contrast that uh, with unconscious leadership. Uh, unconscious leadership, I would say, is making decisions for the good and the glory of whoever the leader is. So we've all seen these types of leaders. We may have even practiced that way ourselves. Uh, conscious leadership is, is being aware of where you where and how you weigh in. I want to just mention, you have a handout on your chairs. I don't want you to go through it. Please, please don't uh, focus on it. It's tempting. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at it, but I, I know we have a short amount of time together. But this, this one sheet that you'll see really compares and contrasts unconscious leadership versus conscious leadership. So when we're finished, I would really invite you to take a look at what is the difference between those two, an unconscious and a conscious, and which one feels better. I was in Sydney, Australia in December, and I'm writing a book called Wake Up and Lead, and it's conversations with conscious executives creating today's top companies. And I had the opportunity to interview Ann Sherry, who's the CEO of Carnival Australia. Amazing woman. And she shared a story with me about how they go and, and they've gone to Papua New Guinea. They started with Papua New Guinea, went to the island, met with islanders, and went to them with ideas about how they could support and engage their economy. They, they went in, created infrastructure, uh, created schools, created ports, and created docks, uh, showed them how to engage tourists 
and then they brought their tourists there to support and enrich that economy. Well, the word got out and that that economy was flourishing, and they had many other tribal leaders from Pacific Islands come to Carnival, Australia, and want to engage in this same type of collaborative relationship. So Anne began to systematize that with the intention of it was a win-win for everybody, very collaborative, and at the end of the day, she shared that Carnival, for the last three years, has had their revenues increasing 20% a year in an industry that's been very flat to declining in terms of revenue growth in the tourism industry, and their profits have gone up 20% a year. So it's really been a huge win, and I would say that that's really an example of conscious leadership. And conscious leadership is going to be evolving based upon the decisions that we make, and I really, you know, it's about listening to the stories, and that's why I made the decision to create this book, Wake Up and Lead, so that, so that everyone can really see by example some ideas of what conscious leadership is about in action. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Philippa, what would you say to that? And does conscious leadership mean that you have to make everybody happy? As we know, leadership engages people. And no, you can't make everybody happy. And politics, of course, you have good examples of that. And um, by the way, I think conscious leadership goes back for years. Look at President Lincoln. His position was not popular, but he knew that was the right thing to do. And that's what you want to do today. Did he make everybody happy? Obviously not, but in the long run, it worked. Moving forward, you've got both Reagan and Clinton, two great leaders, two different parties. So a good leader listens, opens up, analyzes, and acts. And that's what's so important today in the gridlock that Rich was talking about. You know, you can talk and talk and talk, but eventually either you're elected or hired to make things happen, not just to keep engaging in a conversation. Does conscious leadership mean consensus is what we're driving at? I'm not sure, uh, quite frankly, if it does. Um, I, Mark was discussing conscious leadership. I'm thinking about a, an old quote by Peter Drucker. Uh, he said, leadership is defined by results, not attributes. And yet I think at the same time, a great Eisenhower quote, leading is not by knocking someone over the head. That's assault, not leadership. But if you're going to lead any kind of an organization, and let's assume that you have the two or three most important attributes in place, and I would argue it's character, it's integrity, and it's honesty. Once those are in place, then what do we need in a leader? The leader has to be very clear-headed, very clear-headed about where he or she wants to lead the organization. And then they have to assemble a team, a team not of like-minded people necessarily, because I'm one of those who believes that leadership and diversity are inextricably linked. But clearly, you've got to be able to deliver. I think the best way to deliver, both short-term and long-term, is where the values lead. There's an old um, adage about it. they lead by principles. They march by principles. If you think of, for example, two people I had an opportunity to meet and listen to and get to know a little bit, very briefly, Johnny Wooden from Martinsville, Indiana, great legendary UCLA coach, never promised a recruit who went to UCLA to play basketball for him that he would play, or that he would play a particular position. Bo Schembechler, the legendary football coach at Michigan, same way. Bo was from Barberton, Ohio. Never made that kind of a promise. These people led by their character, their integrity, and their honesty. They were conscious leaders, without question. So all of you have implicitly or explicitly been referring to a value system, something, principles that, that guide the leader. Where did those come from? I think values is really the foundation of leadership. There's, there's really three, three key areas.
from my perspective, that are critical in leadership. One is its values. It's really knowing your values and owning your values and living those values. And then it's having courage. And, uh, and then it's really trusting your intuition or your gut instinct, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. But on values, you know, there are, um, it's being really clear on what your values are because that will be your blueprint to decide what you're willing to tolerate and what you're not willing to tolerate. I, you know, I, I spaced out and meant to bring, uh, I've written a, an ebook on unlocking the power of your team using principles and values. If you go to my leftcodegroup.net website, you can download that for free, no charge. And in that, in that book, or in that, it's only 30 pages, it's a very quick read, it has examples from three of my clients, Patagonia, New Belgium Brewing, and Barrel Companies, on how we took them through a values exercise. But in there, what, what, what may help you is there's a cheat sheet, it's probably about, 20, about page 25, that lists off all these ideas of potential values, because many times you'll ask somebody, so what are your values? And they say, well, I really, you know, I don't know, I'm a good person, or integrity. And, and it really, it's just something many times people haven't really thought about. But once you do, it will define who you hire, because you'll want them to be in alignment with your values. Who you stay with, I was talking with John a little bit earlier, and he's saying, you know, how do you get your CEO to really listen? And sometimes it may just be a values disconnect, and then you have an opportunity to decide, is this the right environment? Can I add just a very quick Please footnote? Go. I can think of very few leaders in any conceivable field who were broomed, who were let out the door, so to speak, because they didn't have either the conceptual or the technical skills required to be successful. But I can think of a score of examples of leaders in practically every field that have character flaws. And I think that tells us something pretty darn important. You put, do you want to add? Sure. Rich, are you saying that um, they didn't, there's not enough emphasis put on developing values in school? That's what I'm... We're, I think we're seeing, and I'm a former naval officer, as some of you know, um, had the opportunity to um, travel the, to a good part of the world. Um, the young men in uniform are a microcosm of our society. In the last three months there have been a spate of ethical character issues or abuses, sexual assault, you name it. And I think we, we know that our brave men and women have served well, extraordinarily well, in two, two lengthy wars. But the military is a microcosm of society. The vast majority of soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, are performing magnificently, but some of their leaders recently, as we all know, have not. So I think we need to reaffirm, reestablish, reemphasize moral and ethical training in our service academies and our universities. And I'm pleased that I keep reading about some public universities that are emphasizing more on religion and ethics and philosophy than perhaps they used to, which I think is a very good thing. I'd like to add just a switch to that. Um, you know, there's personal values and there's a community that you're operating in their values. So for myself, that would be the city of Westlake Village. And excitingly, when I was first elected, we formed a group to look ahead. It was called the 2015 Committee. And one of the things we did is line up what we thought the values of the city are and should be. And there were about 16 people on this committee, and we worked for a year establishing the goals for this 2015. And by the way, we're about to redo it since we're almost at 2015. But when we finished, we had a, a beautiful book, but importantly, it listed the values for the city. And when issues come before the council now, we can open that and look at it and say, hmm, does that fit the traditional values or the established values of a city, like promoting jobs, uh, having good schools? They sound simple, but sometimes you just lose track of those things, and having that reference tool, which follows with what Rich is saying here, 
is just remarkably helpful. And I think uh, more universities are starting to do that. And people in their own lives write down what's important to you and use that as your track. Many times people, you know, when they ask what your values are, it's a word. And what I think is really critical is it's important to understand what does that word mean? What does integrity mean? And, and ways in which you can do that are to look at examples and stories. So as you're leading in an organization, you may have your team come together and identify all these wonderful values of teamwork and integrity and uh, uh, equality and customer service, whatever it happens to be. But What's really more important is what do those really mean within the organization? And that's really further defined. You should be thinking about it. So what are examples in our organization? Is Sally in the accounts receivable department who satisfied with serving a, serving a customer and working with them on a, you know, on, a, on a late payment, and she went above and beyond the call of duty to be flexible, is that an example? You know, I mean, that's, that's an exa maybe that's an example of your, of your value. So it's really important you know, when you're leading a group to lead with those examples and those stories. And that breathes life into it. Not just to have it up on the wall someplace or on the back of a business card, but to really have those stories. You're giving me all my, my cues tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's examples and stories. Uh, what role do experiences play in, in forming that, that guiding system, uh, that, that, that value system, and work in general? And specifically, have you had experiences that formed your own uh, view of, of leadership and, and, and values. Can you give us an example of this? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll give one example. Uh, 1995, I was a partner in an investment banking firm. And I was a merger and acquisition partner. My two partners, Tom and Steve, were Harvard MBAs. Uh, they were in, they ran in very uh, in large circles, and they were very connected to the money. I was the person that was buying companies. Went through a period where I bought 25 companies in 29 months for a client of ours that was a public company. And the last deal that we, you know, that we had teed up to close, I felt like it was too complicated, it was the biggest deal, and it was potentially going to sink the company because they couldn't integrate, they couldn't digest them and realize all the efficiencies of the transaction. Went to my partners, Tom and Steve, and I said, look, I don't think we can do this, we can't recommend this in good conscience. And they said, oh, no, 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 you're going to do this because we're going to get this seven-figure fee out of this. This was 1995, in 1995. And uh, it's still a lot of money today. And so we went, I said, let's have a meeting with the CEO. We'll all explain our positions. So we met with Nate. We laid out the positions. I laid out my thoughts as to why this didn't make sense. My partners appealed right to his ego and how wonderful it would be for him to announce this deal. And he says, I want to do it. So it wasn't illegal or unethical. But I had a problem with it because it wasn't in alignment with doing, doing the right thing for our client. So I completed the transaction, and, and, and then it was uh, December 31st. Went into my partners, and I said, guys, I'm out of here. You know, I, this just doesn't work. Obviously, we have some differences in philosophies and, and viewpoints. And I'll tell you what I did is I actually dropped out and did yoga for a year because I was just burned out in the business world. And it took me that year to come back and say, look, I can come back and I can really get clear on my own values and I can operate and lead from that perspective. And I needed that time to clear my head. And I wasn't really thinking along the lines of values. I was just knowing that it wasn't feeling good what we were doing. And so for me, that was a courage issue. Just saying, look, I didn't have anything else, but courage is one of my values. And that's, that's how it began. But did you have a defining moment like, like Mark did? It wasn't so defining, quite honestly. There are a lot of experiences, but I want to touch something before even leadership is being ready through pre-leadership. How do you get there? And you know, there's lots of discussions. Are leaders made? Are they born? And we can discuss that forever. But the one thing I've noticed with leaders, two things actually, is they're prepared and they have a variety of experiences, three things, and they're very flexible. Um, and that started for me right at college, where most of you are now, you're graduating. When I graduated in 72 was the year that Reagan had his big cutbacks. I wanted to be either a social worker or a research psychologist. Those are pretty different, but I actually had a dual major. 
And I found that just wasn't available. All that time, all that work, what am I gonna do? Be flexible, open the doors. I ended up being a travel agent. Had fabulous time, it was kind of dropping out. Yeah, traveling all over the world, having a good time, meeting people, but learned again a lot about interaction. Then eventually I managed a travel agency and then I managed a tour company and then you know the ball just kept rolling from there. Totally different from where I started, especially if you look at a research psychologist. Oh my gosh, now I can't imagine me being stuck in a lab. That, and I would be stuck because I like to be out. I like to be meeting people and listening to your ideas. So be flexible. Get all the experience you can, be it travel, schools, whatever. Listen to the leaders you admire. In fact, Mark touched on this earlier when we were talking to some of the students outside. You can never learn too much, and you emulate, copy even, the people that you admire. You know, they always say copying is a sincerest form of flattery, and it's true. That's where you learn. Take, take their values, take their stance, whatever is going to work, and move it around into your own experience. Uh, my moment came as a junior in high school. I played three sports in high school and one later in college. And I had just been selected as the captain of one of our athletic teams. And after practice, and this is many years ago, but I'll never forget, the coaches took me aside and said, Rich, you know, you've now sort of assumed a position where you have to set more of an example. And uh, I was not sure exactly what they had in mind, and they began to sort of clarify what that example was. Practice harder, longer, work with the younger members of the team, um, and all that comes with being a captain. Fast forward uh, to today, I think those coaches when I was, I guess, 16 or 17, uh, remind me of some people that I've had an opportunity to get to know in my career. They are, for the most part, teachers. Um, I don't think there is any more important responsibility of a leader than that which is to turn around, reach behind you, and pull people up. To be a teacher, not in a classical classroom sense, but a mentor, a developer of talent. I really believe that the central spoke of a winning organization is internally developed talent. It's going to be fascinating to see, and maybe something happened in the last few hours, but I don't think so. It's going to be fascinating to see whether Disney Corporation turns inside to see if they've got internally developed leaders who have been groomed sufficiently to become the CEO, or they go outside. Clifton Wharton and his wife Dolores, black pioneers. The Whartons have distinguished themselves in four different industries. First black president of Michigan State University, first black president of TIAA prep, um, and they have more first than you can imagine. Dolores, Mrs. Wharton, served on more than 30 corporate boards. There are people in CEO positions in college presidencies today who were groomed by the Whartons in East Lansing many years ago. They epitomize, they personify that notion of leaders be a teacher. Um, I, I think, um, I just can't think of anything that's more important. And for those of you who are, and I met some of you earlier uh, in this room before we began, some of you are undergraduates and some of you are working on graduate degree. If you want to see the relative importance of leadership development in an organization, find out how the executives spend their time. There are available on the internet lots of different companies and descriptions of these companies who do a marvelous job of developing their employees at all different levels, not just the top managers, but at all different levels. You think of Intel, GE, Procter & Gamble, and the list goes on and on. But figure out how the executives spend their time before you decide, at least this is my recommendation, 
before you join that company. Because when you're young, you need more experiences. You need more practical experiences under your belt. So that you don't get to a point where you're mid-40s or 50s and you are sent out away from the company because you didn't develop sufficiently through the course of your career or you didn't get candid, honest performance appraisals and people pushed you on and, there's, and then there's a change in leadership and then all of a sudden the reckoning occurs. So those are just a couple of practical suggestions. Mark, can I just, can I just add one other thing? I, you know, in addition to what I just was saying, leadership is really an inside job. It's not that it's only for the executives to be leaders. I think all of you have an opportunity to be leaders in any environment that you're in, whether it's the business environment, whether it's your communities, whether it's your families. And I want to really invite you to be thinking about that. You know, when you look at this one sheet later on, I'm so excited, I'm like beyond excited about uh, the brilliance that I see in the millennials, you know, which many of you are, and how smart you are, and how capable you are. And I, I really want to encourage you there's an opportunity for mentoring both ways, the way I see it. And when we created this Conscious Leadership Connection, it's really for the progressive leaders, the CEOs and senior executives, and also for the millennials. Because I think there's a richness that can occur if you're connecting with progressive leaders that have been there, been the old traditional route, and now they're open to new ideas and, and, and receiving that dialogue. And I encourage you to really be, you know, you can be a leader. You don't have to, you can think of your, be, you are a leader. And it's just whether you want to step in and own that and have impact that's really important. Just gave me another cue. <laughs> we need to have you. Is he, is is he to have your hands more often? <laughs> uh, the cue is you're know, speaking uh, about the divide between generations. Um, and uh, Philippe has, has earlier talked about her experiences traveling uh, and being open and being flexible. Um, the world today has become very global. At CLU, we are very global. We have a very international student body particularly in the graduate programs. Uh, to what extent is, is, does leadership vary across cultures? Would it be, would conscious leadership be a principle that's valid irrespective of the cultural context? Absolutely not. <laughs> we are so fortunate living here today, and I'm sure you're all aware of areas of the world where conscious leadership is not, and it's not a benevolent dictator, it's a real dictator, and there's a lot of problems. Um, but if we lead by example here and keep our course, and keep open and keep trying, we're seeing things change around the world. But even in the US, you know, there's real bad pockets of discrimination, um, and it doesn't matter if you're a woman or anything else, you know, there's just certain people have that mindset and you're not going to get there. Um, so don't keep batting your head against the wall there. Move on. Do something different. Find an area. Find your support group. That's really important for young people as you're developing your talents. Um, and it, it sounds a little hard to say get rid of the people that don't support you, but it's the truth. You need all the support you can get. You need people that will believe in you. That will help you start a company, it will help you start get elected, it will help you with your family and raising them if something comes up. So um, I think we're actually living in a really marvelous time here. I know earlier I said, you know, when you get out of college it's going to be hard. But if you're flexible and you look, there is a lot of opportunity. Now you can tell I used to teach because I've got a prop. So I don't know if any of you saw this article in uh, the Star about Zen and the art of running a company. And the classic company of Patagonia now has Rose Marcario, a woman, as their CEO. And there's so many other examples of this. Anita Ronick, when she started uh, the body shop, I think years ago, was at the forefront. And now transgender, women, whatever, you know, there, there are opportunities for all of us, especially in the US. I just have a couple of suggestions, um, and I'm sure some of what I'm going to say will be seen as um, perhaps controversial. But I'd encourage you to be a global leader, and by that I mean scratch.
crawl, anything you can do to get abroad, to go abroad, a semester, study, work, travel. I said earlier that I believe, and I really do believe this firmly, that the ability to forge consensus among varying different points of view, some really harsh be held, can be modified, mollified by a global leadership perspective. Mary Sue Coleman, who was going to retire in June as the president of the University of Michigan, she and her husband gave a million dollars. Michigan is involved in another, <laughs> in another capital campaign or telephone and mail to reflect that. Um, but they gave a million dollars to enable undergraduate students to defray travel expenses to go abroad. Now it's going to take a lot more because there are 40,000 students in Ann Arbor. But though they're not all undergraduates, obviously. But while you're here or wherever you're going to school or wherever you're working, try to figure out a way, crawl, scratch, whatever. Try to get abroad, study abroad, travel abroad, become a global leader, learn more than one language, because your world will be open in marvelous ways that it may not be today. And get to know people on whatever campus you're on or wherever you're working who are not from the U.S. You know, expand your horizons. You'll be far more interesting, far more successful in my, at least that's my bias, in whatever you do. I, I just don't think there's anything that's perhaps more important than having a global perspective, especially today. Uh, Philippa, you, you, you mentioned uh, female leaders. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, is there equal access yet? Uh, are, is female leadership different from male leadership? What do female leaders bring to a leadership that male leaders don't? A little more compassion on the latter. But, um, you know, as I was saying earlier, there's pockets of problems anywhere. But overall, I think the, the glass ceiling has been shattered. And there's so, again, there is so much opportunity today. But if you're in any minority position, you are in, you're gonna have to work a little harder. You're gonna have to prove yourself a little more, and I don't care how receptive the community is that you're in, it's just a fact of life. So take that and use it. Work hard, but also, as I say that, try to keep your life in balance. Take that time out, do yoga, <laughs> travel, Go abroad, especially, I really condone what Rich was saying there. That is just the best perspective. The more countries you can go to and just sit and attend schools. Um, I went to school for a while in Aix-en-Provence, and then I went to school in Guadalajara. And I just, you know, my first thing is always to get out and experience a different part of the world and learn languages. So next time I learn Chinese, I don't know. That's going to be a tough one, but um, <laughs> I'm going to try. I, I'm male, so I guess I can get away with this. Um, I think, I just made a list before I came, half an hour ago. Uh, and this list should be about a gazillion times longer than it is. But the, this, here's at least a partial list of very prominent female CEOs, and I think most of them are still current. But my point is, when I read you this list, many of these names you know. Some of you may actually know them or know some things about the company. But for our own success, we need six gazillion more women in leadership positions in every organization. And that's my bias, and it's a strong one. Because I've worked in some organizations in my career where that wasn't the case, and I decided I'm not a miracle person, but I'm gonna to try to make some changes in our organization. Some of you in the audience know me pretty well, and we made some changes in a few places. But here's a real quick list, Mary Barra. GM, Meg Whitman, HP, Ginny Rometty, IBM, Indra Nui, PepsiCo, Marilyn Houston, Lock, 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 Lockheed Martin, Marissa Mayer, Yahoo, Ursula Burns, Xerox, and of course we all know Sheryl Sandberg, the COO at Facebook. But these are amazing people, but 
as a male, I will say, at least it's been my experience, that most women are better at collaborating. They're better at forming teams. And that's not easy for me to say, but that's my view, and we need many, many more women in industry and in higher education. The president of Michigan is a woman, the president of Michigan State's a woman, I think President Brown is a woman, a woman, the president of Pittsburgh is a woman, the president of Scripps, I believe, is a woman, but not enough. So but you wanted to jump in here? Well, I just wanted to add to that um, with command. <laughs> Women bring, I think, a lot of empathy to the table, but I notice more and more men are bringing empathy too. Um, so numbers aren't as important to me anyway as who's there and how they govern a company or you know a city, whatever. Um, and empathy is so important and how you develop those relationships, how you get everybody on board that you've been talking about. They're both on board, yeah, that's right, okay. So Mark, uh, are women better at conscious leadership? I'm sorry? Are women better at conscious I, leadership? I would, I would not say that women are better. Or, I, I would say that we have a wonderful opportunity to roll out conscious leadership from, from the middle up. Um, you know, we have, my experience is that many of you, the millennials, really understand the concept. Uh, many of these concepts that we need to do something different because what we've been doing in the past hasn't been working and I think that's the premise for, you know, for conscious leadership is that that's the opportunity. And with, you know, to Philippa's point, it's not necessarily whether it's a man or it's a woman, it's what are the principles that they're embodying. And I think as more and more people become aligned with some of these principles, like the principles of conscious leadership, which I have a lot of passion about, it's, it's almost like, a, you know, it, it becomes infectious. So you know how when somebody's really excited, it starts the ball rolling. It's just like conscious leadership, it's about awareness. You know, we're not always gonna be perfect, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna make mistakes, but the key is to really be engaged in the conversation, to pause and say, is this really, is this for, for the greater good? Is this from a higher perspective? And I think there's an opportunity, to your point, Gerard, men and women, it doesn't have to be men and women, I think, and, and, and with more, as more and more women come in, we have to be careful not to just say we want her there because she's a woman. We want her there to have, the, because she's bringing the right philosophy, she has that interest for the greater good. The profit and, and financial objectives are really important. But until we begin to, to focus on the greater good, you know, we're going to be challenged with sustainability. I don't mean in a green sense. I mean sustainability globally. Time is really flying. Uh, we would like to uh, leave some time for questions from the audience. So I'd like to ask the, the last question here for each one of you. Uh, what is the best leadership advice that you have got? Uh, Rich, work very hard. Keep your nose clean. Don't foreclose options because if you get into trouble with the law, it's tougher to get ahead in life. Um, I grew up in a small town in rural Northern California. Um, so that, those thoughts um, had meaning for me. It wasn't fancy, uh, it was just direct. Do well, if you, if you keep your nose clean, work hard, find your way to continue your education, you'll do fine, and uh, it's worked, at least to my satisfaction. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I like to say, take the long view, but don't take a long time to act. That is so important. As we all have said, you know, you've got to be flexible, you've got to be inclusive, and you have to know the difference between management and leadership, something that we don't really have time to get into tonight. But that's a vast, vast difference. And when you know that, you will be an effective leader. Uh, I've had the great force of so many wonderful mentors. Jim Carroll, when I, when I first began running a mortgage company, I, I, I had a financial background, I was with Arthur Anderson. And I was leading, I was responsible for leading all these divisions within this mortgage company. And I was struggling because the sales, the sales organization wasn't really responding too well to me, the IT, human resources, all these different departments that I really had no, I had no experience with. I was, you know, I started off in that accounting field. 
And Jim came to me and he said, look, you know, you're really making this hard. You're trying to manage everybody as if they were part of your finance and accounting department. You know, wanting to have analysis, wanting to have schedules, wanting to have details. When you have know, many times the sales team, you know, they don't really respond really well to you know, having all the detail and all the documentation. They're out there to sell. So his advice to me was, just try and put yourself in the shoes and use the lingo and use the use the focus of whatever the department is. And when I began to do that, boy, life got a lot easier. You know, just as I walked around and I, you know, I didn't talk to the finance people the same way I talked to the sales people or the IT people or the operations people. That was really helpful. Thank you, Mark. So, questions from the audience. When a woman becomes CEO of a company after our history of trying to break through the glass ceiling, is there any antagonism from the men on the team? Good question, but I think, again, that depends on the company or the area that you're in. Of course, you run into that um, sometimes, and sometimes not. Depends on the team. I, I think it really depends on the woman. You know, it depends on the individual and their ability to connect and, and garner respect. And I think also a, a key quality of future leadership is trust. Trust going both ways. So as leaders, we need to, you know, we need to be able to trust our teams, and our teams need to be able to trust us. And I think we're going to see that that's going to be a really ongoing theme. And many times, I don't know how many people are familiar with the work of Brene Brown, who is is really she's done a tremendous TED talk. She, she speaks on the topic of vulnerability. So my experience in working with teams, and I do a lot of work with teams, is you know, trust follows vulnerability. So it, and, it, and that takes courage, too. It doesn't mean dump, dumping everything out there, but it means demonstrating a transparency. And so it's building that trust. And so I think in response to your question about women, I think it depends on the woman. And if, it's up to her. Because sometimes you may have women out there that are very, they have a very strong male energy. So they come in running it just like a man. You know, they're 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 really a man in a, in, in women's clothing. And so it's it's what do we need? You know, there's a shift and things are, are gradually shifting. I think we need both. We need that we need that feminine leadership. But, you know, and, and it's that balance that's going to help us to begin to shift things. I, I would simply say I think that the person you're referring to has to put a premium a premium on performance. She has to be really good. Presumably she is, is really good or she wouldn't be in that role. But I think a lot depends on the culture, as my colleagues have basically sort of implied. Um, if she is a change agent, and most CEOs tend to be in one way or another, I think it's particularly important to be aware of the culture, the organizational culture that is present. Um, but I would agree with my colleagues that so much depends on her uh, leadership style, which is really important, but the performance has got to be there too. All right. Hello there. My name is uh, Donnie Nips, and very informative by the way. Thank you. Um, two quick questions, very related. Is there, in, in your eyes, is there a link between great leaders and great leaders being connected to some spiritual tradition or, or faith tradition, their own? Whatever that is, and then secondly, is there is there a link between even deeper? Is there a link between these great leaders and the value or virtue of humility? Or how do you define that? Wow, that's quite a question, and I have to admit, I haven't really thought about it. Um, if you could make a blanket statement like that about leaders and their religious affiliations or whatever, that's, you know, I think it's more the value system that we've been talking about, the experience, the persistence, and one thing that we haven't talked about, quite honestly, is the willingness to fail and just get up again. That's really important for a leader, you know, when this, uh, the old Apollo 13 movie, you know, we don't, a failure is not an option, but this isn't a space mission, this is your life, and failure is an option, and it will happen, and you'll pick yourself up, and hopefully you'll learn from it, and that's the biggest thing to me, is that you're able to take everything in and keep learning, and when you know you're right, you're right, push for it. What was the second part of the question? Humility. Okay. I'll, I'll 
take a stab at humility. I, my bias, strong bias, I admit, is that the best leaders are humble people. Um, that they're able to galvanize people around a set of collaboratively developed goals and move forward with gusto. Um, I think of Tom Monahan, the founder of, founder of Domino's that I knew well years ago, and Dave Brandon, who followed him, was now the athletic director at Michigan. These were, were two very different people, but in their own individual ways, both very humble. And I have uh, Tom Monahan as a deeply religious Catholic. He was orphaned early on, was uh, taken care of by nuns in southeastern Michigan. Dave uh, is also a strong Catholic. Um, I'm reminded of, I think the word pontiff means bridge builder. These two people were very different, but they built bridges uh, figuratively and literally in their careers. But if you get to know them, you find out beyond everything else. They're deeply spiritual, but they're also incredibly humble. We have a question to the last girl. You know, that's a great question. I mean, I just, my position is, many times, it's not really clear. A culture is, is a direct reflection of the values. Whether an organization has gone through that values exercise or not, the culture is reflected in that. My view is, many times it takes courage to realize that someone, either someone maybe a relationship, maybe that you're in a relationship with, maybe a job that you're involved with, uh, maybe, a, maybe a group that you're interested in joining, if the values are not in alignment, it's just going to be a matter of time before it breaks down and you reach your tolerance and something doesn't work. I see so many companies, they'll, they'll see a resource out there that they really like. Maybe there's a computer coder, and this coder has brilliant skills. But the values aren't really in alignment with the culture. And so they decide, well, from an economic standpoint, you know, we really need this person right now, so we're going to hire this person. And they bring the person on, and then they, they, re they realize the, you know, the, the person does something that violates their company's core values. So then what they have to do is they have to make the change. So if you're, I would say in response to your question, if, you know, that's what I did. You know, my partners and I, we did not have an alignment of our values. And in the environment, when I was in that investment banking environment, you know, when you're busy and you're traveling and you're going really fast, many times you don't stop to say, am I really in alignment with, with the values of the organization I'm working with? And when I concluded no, it was, it was, really, it was really upsetting to me. That was when I made the change. So I, my, my best advice is, if you're in the environment, cut your losses now. It's yes. only going to be more painful. It's only going to get harder to change. I would agree. I think the word I use is fit. If, if, it, if, it, if it doesn't seem to you that you and the organization constitute a reasonably comfortable fit, I'm with Mark. I would move on. I think it was Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, who said, going to bring about changes, create a new model. Well, I interpret that in this case as moving on go to another place where there's a, a more strategic fit and where you'll be happier and you'll be therefore more successful. I, I want to add one more thing. <clears throat> That's where the intuition comes into play. Because you know sometimes you may be involved in an organization or be recruiting, you know, to join an organization and you're not really clear on what their values are. You can't quite get a fix on it because it's not posted any place and it's not described. And you know, I guess they've got this site out called Glassdoor. If you guys heard of that, you know, where it's it's the rating from the company, from the individuals inside the organization. You know, it's kind of a, I think it's an anonymous program where they'll rate what it's like to work at this company. I was I would really strongly encourage you to tune in to what your gut is telling you, what your intuition is telling you. You know, you go for the interview. What do you think of the person that was interviewing you? If you go for an office visit, what you know, what was it like at the office visit? How did you feel? Did you feel at peace? Did you feel comfortable? I mean, tune into your body. Because your body has an immense amount of wisdom. And the more and more you tune into that, and the more you trust it, the stronger and the clearer it is. It's, and even to not jump, I mean, you may need to have the job. You may say, i got to have this job. Because you know what? If you compromise, then you're stuck there for a long time. Instead of, you know, you're better off saying, okay, I'm going to have faith. And what is faith? Faith is just, just knowing that whatever it is you're wanting to have happen, is underway. It's in play. You may not see the physical manifestation of it, but you're moving 
toward it. And so it's just having faith, visualizing exactly the environment they want to be in, but don't sell out. Thank you, Mark. I think we have time for about two more questions. We have one back there, and then Yes, in studying exceptional leaders, have you found that overall they have highly developed negotiation and conflict management skills, and whether there are gender differences with negotiation and conflict management skills? I believe the latest studies are still showing that women leaders are making less than men and potentially still leaving money on the table. And there was there a connection between, was there a connection that you wanted to make between the, you know, the, success, the qualities of successful leaders versus uh, the women leaving money on the table? I just want to give some clarification. I, I think the relationship here is that one of the theories behind unequal pay uh, is that, that women just negotiate, don't oh, negotiate I uh, in, in the salary. Right, they're not like asking or negotiating and therefore potentially leaving money on the table. said before, sometimes that exists and sometimes it doesn't, and that's part of the fit with the company, but I think as women, we're more bold today to ask. You know, you have to learn the questions to ask, right, and as we women who are trans, uh, going from the home or into the workplace, I know for myself, I didn't have any business background, you know, that just came with life experiences. And then when you add, so you're all at an advantage that you have the schooling and you know the questions to ask. So it's it's changing. Yeah. Rich, you can probably add to it. I would simply say, and I'm not sure if this will be helpful to you or not, but I, I'm a firm believer that conflict is healthy. Now it has to be controlled to some extent, and I don't like to use that verb, but I mean you can't let it go wild. But conflict, airing differences in a team setting, is extraordinarily important for making progress. So I look for leaders who have those, if you will, conflict resolution skills. Don't, not leaders who bury conflict, but will encourage it and are able to manage it and channel it to constructive outlets. I've seen some marvelous men do it marvelously, and I've seen some marvelous women do it marvelous, marvelously. So I, that would, those would be my comments. One last question. All right, thank you very much, panelists and, and attendees. Dr. Shane, this one's for you. Uh, we've touched, and I think this might be an app close, uh, on, on the idea of culture and the power and influence of leadership relative to culture. And I've heard said that, in fact, executive leadership is the DNA of an organization. And how it is they live and, and exemplify the values inherent in the organization, the stories that are told around those experiences are paramount and very valuable toward uh, maintaining culture and also towards changing culture. And there's a lot of effort and, and energy around cultural change. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, it's not uncommon, or at least it's, it has not been uncommon in my experience, that the companies that I've worked with, um, consulted with, not infrequently, the culture really kind of flows, stems, emanates from the CEO. I mean, I, and unless it's a CEO of several years past the founder, I think of Thomas Watson at IBM, clearly established that culture. Um, David Packard and Bill Hewlett established the HP culture. It's changed, but they really changed. They established it. Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel um, established the Amway culture. Um, but cultures change and leaders change. And um, I think a smart person is one who comes in and carefully, carefully analyzes and if it's, if it's somebody coming in from the outside, as we'll see with what Disney does, as I said earlier, we don't know. But I think you want to be 
really careful not to monkey with the culture until you understand it fully. And you better make sure you've got a team that's highly credible and highly respected if you're going to tweak the culture of an organization, because it can backfire. I think the vast, well, not vast majority, but I think more than maybe 60% of change efforts fail. So I, I would tread, I guess, lightly and carefully would be my advice. Mark, looks like you want to Yeah, I think, there's, a, I think there's, there's definitely a correlation between values and culture. You know, uh, to reach this point, at some point, an organization is so big, it has a culture that's so ingrained, it's, it, it becomes like that super tanker. You know, it, it has so much momentum, it's hard to shift that. As opposed to some of the small, smaller companies, the startup companies, where it's very maneuverable. And I, and I do agree that the culture is, is really set by the senior team. And it's not even what they say, it's what they do. I, you know, I had a, I had a mentor once that, said, that, that shared, he said to me, look, if you really want to know what's happening, he says, people are going to tell you all kinds of things. Just watch how they spend their time, watch how they spend their money. And that'll, that'll speak volumes. And, and in terms of establishing that culture, just watch, you know, management can pick all kinds of lip service, but are they really, are they really delivering that? That'll speak to you about what the real culture is. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. Thank you very much, audience. You know,